Well, good morning. good morning. It's so good to see everybody as we gather into worship. And uh, what a wonderful and a special day as we welcome the Loposser family uh, for their yearly um, uh, annual reunion. And we always look forward to them. And uh, we are coming off of a week of vacation Bible school, which was absolutely incredible. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to worship today and what God's going to do. You're in for some treats today. Uh, let me just uh, give a little disclaimer. We had shared that the Ray Ball singers were going to be with us today, and they were. Uh, they were on the schedule, but uh, Miss Annette, who sings with them and plays, had a little mishap this week. And uh, she, they were on a boat, and the boat hit a little wave, and she fell and hurt herself. And so they are not going to be able to be with us today, but we're going to worship anyway. Amen. Amen. And uh, so it's going to be a great day. Benji and his family, uh, we want to pray for them as Erica's brother passed away this week unexpectedly. They're taking a few days of vacation. And so Brother Justin is going to be leading us in worship this morning. And you pray for Justin and pray for Brother Clyde because he's going to be bringing the word this week. This week, this morning, uh, I was telling people this week that Clyde Loposter was preaching this Sunday, and I have a name for him. He's called the Sermonator. <laughs> He's the Sermonator. He can do it. You're in for a blessing. And so pray for Brother Clyde as he brings the Word of God to us today. But I wanted to give you a report of some amazing things God did, did this week at Vacation Bible School. Uh, we registered, I believe, right at about 115 kids. That was not including workers. And we had an incredible, incredible week. But the greatest news of all is five of those kids received Christ as their Savior this week. And we praise the Lord for that. And then there were other kids who responded to the invitation, but they weren't quite ready yet. They didn't quite have all the pieces together. And so, but you could tell the Lord's at work and it's going to be soon for them, I believe. And so we continue to pray for all of them. And those children, listen at this, our mission project for Vacation Bible School this year was the Women's Care Center in Sevier County that uh, helps ladies who are in preg uh, crisis pregnancies to give them wise and godly counsel and to help them. And... Uh, they were our mission project this week, and those children raised $1,605 to go to the Women's Care Center this week. So we are very thankful for all that God is doing. And then let me mention one more thing before I forget. Next Sunday, uh, as a church, we will observe the ordinance of baptism, and uh, we have two scheduled to be baptized next Sunday, and uh, so... Uh, next Sunday is going to be a very special day as well. But every Sunday is a special day when we gather as God's people. Amen. But uh, to our guests, we are so thankful that you're here with us today and to worship with us. I want to ask you to do me a favor. In your worship bulletin is a little tear-off corner called the Connection Card. If you would, take a few minutes and fill that out. It tears out. And then when you leave today... There's a basket on the round table out in the foyer. Just drop those connection cards in that basket. There are also baskets that you exit this side of the building. Um, there are baskets there at the doors. You can drop them in those baskets as well, along with any offerings or tithes. All of it goes in those baskets. But fill that connection card out for us. We would love to know a little bit about you. And thank God for you being here. I love to be able to pray for you. And on the back of that same connection card, you can tell us how we can pray for you specifically. And uh, we all have prayer needs at different times and need a little extra prayer. And uh, tell us how we can pray for you specifically. It tears out. And again, just drop it in those same baskets as you exit today. And we'll try to remind you of that. But um, it's going to be a great, great day. Amen. Amen. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Um, are you ready to worship church? I know I am. Justin, you come on and lead us this morning. Good morning. 
sure is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing. We've been in the book of Revelation, Pastor Glenn, and uh, just got me to thinking about heaven. So we're going to sing when we all get to heaven this morning. If, we're, uh, if we believe in Jesus Christ, then we're going to have this. We have this blessed assurance that he keeps us and holds us and that we will see him again one day in heaven. Let's sing blessed assurance. <laughs>
We'll jump right into uh, scripture reading today, and um, it's going to be in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. A lot of you uh, know this verse very well. He says, Jesus is speaking. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. One of my jobs at home is, uh, is helping our three-month-old baby calm down when he's crying. And uh, that, that is a job, by the way. I didn't realize it was going to be so difficult at times. But, uh, but what after seems like hours of rocking him to, to sleep, I'll look down at him and he's just totally at peace. He's, in that moment, he just completely trusts me. Uh, and it made me think about my trust in God the other night. My, during, during my times of trouble, and the Bible talks about how God holds us in the palm of his hand. And when I read this verse now and I think about Finding rest in God, I can imagine him holding me just like I hold my son. Looking down at me with nothing but love in his eyes. That's what he wants for you all today. Will you trust him? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be in your house this morning. Thank you for this promise that no matter what I face in life, I can always bring it to you and exchange it for peace. You never, it never ceases to amaze me, Lord, how the same God who can breathe stars into existence and spoke the universe into being wants to have an intimate and personal relationship with someone like me. So thank you for loving me. Thank you for grace and mercy. Lord, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. There's a song that I just wanted to bring to you this morning. It's been on my heart for several years. I've actually had the, 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 the CD, the track, for, for a while now, and I've just never, never actually uh, gotten a chance to sing this or have, have had the opportunity, but I feel like in today's world, especially after the year that we've had, there's a, there's a sweet message in this song for anyone who is um, out of God's family, if you're away from church, even, even in your own homes, there's, there's discord and dysfunction. And, and so this, this song is for any of you out there. And um, if, if this is live later or, or for, uh, on, on the website later, this is for many people who are watching. Um, there's always a place at the table.
singers this morning, but we also have something just as, someone just as, as wonderful, and I'd like to invite Miss Debbie to come and bring us a, a song as well this morning, and uh, ooh, I know you're going to be blessed by what God has laid on her heart today. Thank you for that short message to those kids. Be strong and of good courage, because the, for the Lord is with me. Amen. I get nervous up in front of people, especially people I don't know. I do love to sing for the Lord. Um, I'm really thankful. The Bible says make a joyful noise. He didn't say make a beautiful noise. So um, just listen to the words. There's a couple that have been on my mind, if that's okay. Usually I'll get Dennis to play Wayfair and Stranger for me because I just love to listen to the way he plays, but I also love the song too. So just pretend he's playing in the background. <laughs> I am a poor wayfarer and stranger Traveling through this world of woe But there's no sickness, toil or danger In that bright world to which I go I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going. 
choirs will gather around me. I know my way is rough and steep. The beauteous fields lie just before me. Where God's redeemed, their vigils keep. I'm going there to see my mother. She said she'd meet me when I come. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. Isn't that a blessing to know that we as Christians, we're just going over Jordan. Um, we've been coming to the Low Pass Reunion up here for a long time, and I've really enjoyed it and always look forward to it. And about, oh gee, I don't know, 2005, I guess, my husband had a couple different cancers. Uh, in 2007, he had another one. At that time, I told him one more, and I'm just going to shoot you and put you out of my misery. <laughs> um, this past week, he had another diagnosis of another one. He, he's over there. I didn't shoot him yet. Um, well, the jury's still out on that now. Not really. It's, uh, he's doing real good with it. But when he got it in 2005, um, his response is the same as it is today. It is what it is. And it's good either way. For him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so we, I started singing the song to him about, about that time. A loved one knew he'd reached the end of life's journey, but he'd been holding to God's hand a long, long time. And as I knelt beside his bed, my heart was thrilled at what he said, if I go or if I stay. Victory's mine. Oh, I'm a winner either way. If I go or if I stay, for I still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have my healing here below or life forever if I go. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way. None of us really knows about tomorrow. We must prepare to go to heaven any day. So for now, just trust the Lord. He'll lead you safe to your reward. And by his grace, you'll be a winner either way. Oh, I'm a winner either way. If I go or if I stay, for I'll still have my Jesus each passing day. I'll have my healing here below, or life forever if I go. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm a winner either way.
Amen. Thank you so much. Wasn't that beautiful? We praise the Lord for that. That come from the depths of her heart. And um, what a word of praise to the Lord. God is good. Amen. You know, when you're a believer, no matter what you're walking through, you're never, ever without hope because of Jesus. And we thank God for that. Well, it is my joy to introduce to you one of my favorite preachers, Brother Clyde Lopasser. I call him the Sermonator. And God always lays a very special message on his heart to us. We look forward to this time each and every year. <coughs> Brother Nancy Wells. Nancy. Um, was, yes or not, I had... Is Nancy Wells here? I think Brother Clyde was going to call on you to sing as well. <laughs> I don't think she's here, Brother Clyde. Okay. So listen, you come on and bring the word God has laid on your heart to us. Brother Clyde is one of our oldest deacons and he is the ever ready bunny. Don't let his age fool you. Amen. Tell him, tell him about that cough drop before you get started. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Come on. Come on, brother. <coughs> oh, fuck you. You might have to help me, too. All right. Aren't you glad that Dennis had that boat wreck? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you tell him what I said. Though. It's so good to be here. So many of you I don't know anything about my preaching, so I guess I should tell you a little bit about it. I suppose that the Apostle Paul was one of the greatest preachers that ever lived outside of Christ. But you know, on, I can think of one occasion that I think I could have beat him. For instance, over in the 20th chapter of Acts, we find a story where Paul was up in this... <coughs> third floor of this building of preaching and he was, said there's much lighting they didn't have air conditioning back then so they used torches or oil burning lamps and they had the windows raised and this one guy was sitting in the window and Paul preached till midnight and that boy fell out of the window went to sleep fell out of the window and got killed I don't know what time Paul started preaching but Apparently he had preached for several hours before they come went to sleep. And here's where I think I could beat the Apostle Paul. I could have put that guy to sleep in 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, so if you go to sleep, it'll be all right. So, uh, this one young preacher come to be the pastor and uh, he's kind of a little bit cocky and he said, uh, there's two guys sitting back there and one of them went to sleep. He called on that and said, wake that guy up. He said, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> and my button story, the preacher on the tail, this guy, he had a habit of using a cough drop to, to time his message with. And this one day he got up to preach and uh, he just kept on and on preaching. So he checked to see what was wrong. He'd put a button in his mouth. <laughs> Of the cough drop. So we get over the joke part and get down to business. <laughs> Our message today is taken from the 15th chapter of Luke. Brother Bruce Yates, he's not with us today, but he told me a few weeks ago, or he preached a few days ago, and he's preaching the 15th chapter of Luke, and it was in the bulletin. So I go to him and tell him, I said, Preacher, you're going to have to change that. I'm going to preach that on our family reunion. And he said, it's too late now. So if you want to follow along with us, we, we're from the 15th chapter of Luke. Uh, the world's greatest story. The, the, long, the short story has always been popular reading. Ed, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Deacons, Orson Irvin, O. Henry and many more were masters at the short story form. But in the Bible we find the greatest short story of them all. It's the story of the prodigal son. And Jesus was 
its author. Jesus told three great stories in the 15th chapter of Luke, but this one is greatest and the most familiar one. The first story he told was for the man. He talked about a man losing and finding a sheep. For most of his listeners were shepherds, and they understood it. The second story he told was for the women. He talked about a coin they wore as ornament, and they understood it. But the third story he told was for all of his listeners. He talked about a lost boy, and this story touched the heart of all of them. Now notice the ascending value of these stories. The first of the sheep had commercial value. The second, the coin, had sentimental value. But the third one, the boy, had both spiritual and personal value. I can imagine in the odds of Jesus, there might have been a young man who was a prodigal. When he heard this story, his heart was stirred, and he went home to his father to live a good life. And we know that since that time, that many of you young men has had their hearts stirred and caused to turn from a life of sin to a life in Christ by this same story retold by some servant of God. Now you know the story. This young man grew tired of this restraint and discipline of the home. So he asked his father for his portion of his inheritance and he gave it to him. Then he journeyed into a country far away. Soon he got in with the wrong crowd and spent all his money in righteous living and sin. And he was reduced to eating in the hog pen. Then he came to his senses and he went home where his father received him gladly and gave him the best that he had. Now, in the story, we see three steps downward and three steps upward. The first step downward is restlessness. He grew tired, as we said, of the strain and the discipline of the home. So he asked his father his portion of his inheritance. Then he traveled into that faraway country and got into trouble. He was reduced to eating in the hog pen. Finally, he came to his senses and he went home where his father received him gladly. Now, many of a young person has become restless at home and dissatisfied. Two young brothers joined the Navy and went off to sea, leaving behind a weeping mother. The pastor visiting that home sometime later felt that he understood what happened. On the wall in the dining room, right where those boys saw it three times a day, was a large, beautiful picture of a raging sea. And he thought, as those boys looked at that picture, there arose in them a desire to go to sea. As this young man heard these tall stories from the faraway country, he became restless. Nearly every young person has this feeling when they become dissatisfied with the things at home. So we need to make our homes as attractive as possible for our young people. Then we need to pray for them what we pray for nothing else. The home ties and the apron string, as we said, became irksome to this man. The second step down is recklessness. Cairo called the young man. So did Memphis, Damascus, Persia, and India. Now he knew the cost, but in his recklessness, he was willing to spend his fortune in sin and pleasure. He, here's a man who had inherited a fortune. Rather than putting part away for his old age, he said, I'm young but honest. I'm going to have a good time. So he flung away his money in sin and pleasure and soon was penniless. Another man did the opposite. He was Moses. Moses was offered money, pleasure, position, but he gave it all up to take on the job of liberating slaves. He gave his life for service to God and man, and his name is listed among the greats of the world. Many of a man has been reckless enough to go out into the world, spend his life in sin and pleasure, and reduced to nothing. The third story stepped down is ruin. With his money spent, his friends gone, in a country far from home, with nothing to eat, he makes a picture of the sinner. The sinner goes out into the world and loses what's best and greatest for him. Now we notice this young man was not ruined in one sudden jump. 
It was a gradual thing. First he had a great old time. Then he lost his money. And when his money is gone, his so-called friends were gone. And then he ended up in the pig pen. And this way of thinking, this was about as low as one could go. The Jewish people felt that way. The devil doesn't bring us down in one sudden jump either, but he tempts us and he leads us on. Roland Hill <clears throat> saw a farmer leading a group of hogs to the slaughterhouse. And he was astonished at how he got those hogs to follow him. He carried a bucket of corn along, dropping a few grains on the ground as he walked along. Those hogs followed him, eagerly gobbling up that corn, and soon they were in the slaughterhouse with the door close behind them. So it is with the devil. He doesn't bring us down in one sudden jump, but he tempts us and he leads us on. And if we're not careful, he'll lead us to the slaughterhouse of eternal death. Now when the boy left home, he did not know that he would end up in the hog pen. He thought only of the freedom and joy before him. He did not see those steps leading downward. And if the devil came to us with horns, a forky tail, and a pitchfork in his hands, we would slam the door in his face in a moment. But he comes to us like he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. And if we're not careful, we'll follow him to the depths of sin. An artist was painting a picture of the second or the Last Supper. He said, I need someone to model for the picture of Christ. I must find a young man who is pure and good. So he found a young man in the church choir named Peter Bandanella. Purity and goodness showed in his face, and he used him for the model of Christ. Somewhere he said he set that picture aside. And it was years before he decided to finish it. So he said, now I must find someone for the model of Judas. I must find a man who is debased, who has the very marks of sin written in his face. So he goes searching and sleeping down on the bridge. He found a homeless man who bore those very marks. And he engaged him for the model. And as he was painting, he asked the question, what is your name? The man answered Peter Bandanella. The face that once shone so brightly with purity and goodness was now scarred by sin. Sin is ruinous to all of us. The, how true the old saying is that sin will take you farther than you ought to go. It will cost, cost you more than you want to pay and it will keep you, or it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. So sin is ruinous to all of it. Now the three steps upward. The first step upward is repentance. The boy came to himself. He thought of his friends and his loved ones, and he became very sorry for having left home and fallen into sin. When a man realizes the condition he's in and what he has left, up, left off, it is a hopeful sign. He was homesick. The best part of any trip is always getting back home, isn't it? A soldier returning to the America after the war looked at the Statue of Liberty and said, Old lady, if you ever see me again, you'll have to turn around meaning he had no intention of ever leaving home again. And I'm sure that the prodigal felt that way when he thought of his home and his loved ones and he became very homesick for them. The next step down is, uh, or up or better, is uh, repentance. Or we said repentance. He came sorry for his sins and his home and his loved ones. The next step downward or upward is ruin, or return rather. He uh, thought it was home. If he had not returned, we know it would not have been true repentance. But he was sorry for his sin and he returned home. A soldier, 
as we said, left home and returned back happy. The next step upward is the restoration. A, a pastor once asked a group of young people, what is repentance? One little boy said, it's being sorry for your sins. A little girl spoke up and said, it's being sorry enough for your sins to leave them. And I'm sure the prodigal must have felt that way. He was glad to be home. He was, he was happy to be back home. The last step upward is restoration. As we look at the son returning home, we want to shift our thinking to the father. We, I can almost see the father pacing back and forth in front of the house, praying and looking for his son to come home. Then one day he saw this familiar sight coming up the road. When he got close enough to realize it was his son, he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He didn't ask him where he'd been. He didn't ask him where he saw that money. He didn't ask him why he did it. He didn't say, I knew you'd get into trouble and come to this. And God doesn't ask us all those questions either when we come to him. He just takes us in his arms kisses away all those ugly scars. <laughs> he makes us beautiful in his sight and fit for heaven. When we get to heaven, we'll not tremble in his presence on account of our sins. He has cast them into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. And how far is that? There's no limit. <laughs> Now let's go back and look at what happened when the boy, he made up his story that he's going to tell his father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no, word, no more worthy to be your, called your son. He had really repented. He thought it would be better to be a slave in his father's house than to be a, among those higher ups in that faraway country. So we see his father, uh, when he started telling him what, to, I don't know if he even heard what he said or not. His father turned to the servant and said, bring the best robe and put it up there. The best robe was reserved for real special guests. And how much more special did they get than that son coming home? Then he said, put a ring on his hand. That was a stigma ring. It had a mark on it. And it was used similar to our credit cards, modern day credit cards. The boy, he didn't have to go barefooted anymore. He didn't have to go hungry anymore. He had money, did So God treats us that way when we come to him. Then he said, put shoes on his feet. The slave didn't wear shoes only the owner and his family. So he had to choose back then. And he said, kill the fatted calf and let's eat and be merry. Make music and be merry. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So we need to remember that he was happy. Now we see this son, when he come back, he felt so unworthy to take up his old position there. And it's a good thing for a man to feel his unworthiness before God. The man who cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, was much nearer to God than that Pharisee who boasted of his goodness. Have you ever been bothered with pride? Has it ever made you feel like you might be a little better than somebody else? I'm gonna tell you a story that none of you have ever heard before. And it's about myself. Back when W. A. Gallion was pastor at our church for the second time, he met with us deacons and he told us that he wanted a church to observe layman's day. That's where the men did it all. The men taught the Sunday school class, the men sang in the choir, and one of the men would be bringing a message. 
So my name was brought up real quick. And I thought, boy, I must be good. And, and then I went to work on them assets and then the WA brought or appointed Gene Miller to be responsible for seeing that all those positions were filled. And that come down to the, I think about the middle of the week before the Sunday when we're supposed to take, do this. And, and WA had forgot to tell Gene about it. So Gene called me and said, I can't find anyone to preach Sunday. He said, I've called Preacher Jeff Hilton and he's already booked. I've called Bill Astley, who was the director of missions at that time, and he's booked. He said, would you be willing to get up there and give your testimony and say a few words? And I said, well, I thought I was supposed to preach. Uh, they asked me to, and he said, oh, I didn't know that. So I preached, and after that, the service, Lodge Garner came up to me and he said, tell me how good it was. And he said, I would not change one word if I could. And that made me feel, as Sterl Johnson would say, pretty good. <laughs> and then W.A. come back that night to church and he was telling me what a good job I'd done and that I must have put a lot of time into that message and it was the best service that we'd had since he'd come back the second time. Then later on, Lodge Garner come back with another story. He said uh, his nephew, Drew Garner, had preached his first message at church here. And he went off to Texas for seminary training, but he always come back to Shallow and preached on the anniversary of his first message. And they called him as pastor in uh, Dallas or Houston. So he come back and he was staying with his uncle, first house over here on the road, and they was talking about the church. And Drew asked Lodge, who is Shallow's best Christian? And Lodge said, I would have to think about that a minute. He said, I would have to say Clyde Lowe Foster. And he come and told me that. And my head swelled about three hat sizes. And I got to my arm has hurt real bad today. It's doctor says it's arthritis, but I think it come from patting my stuff in the back. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to think about that one night, and something crossed my mind. It's as plain as if it had been spoken out loud. If you're the best Christian, that Shallow's God. Shallow was in one poor shape. So if we're bothered with pride, we need to get away from it. God hates it. It seems that God has put into the mankind's heart and mind to want to live as long as we can upon this earth. But he's also given us enough knowledge of heaven to make us want to go there when we die. I just wonder if he could pull back the curtains and let us look in the head. We'd probably go home and commit suicide. <laughs> it's so beautiful. If you're here today and you're not Ready to go there? Don't leave. Come to you. You may be out in a far country, spiritually speaking. There's nothing out there but sorrow and defeat. Come back to him. He's waiting for you. Gypsy Smith, a great evangelist, was conducting a revival, tent revival in Denver, Colorado. And the county sheriff was seated on the platform behind him for some reason. When the invitation come, Gypsy asked if there's anyone there that desired that he pray for the salvation of their soul. 
Gypsy did not see that hand, but the sheriff leaped to his feet and shouted, get that young man while he feels that way. The next morning, the sheriff was having breakfast in the cafeteria and the gypsy walked in and he took his seat at the table with him. And while they were talking, gypsy learned that the sheriff was not a sheriff, not a Christian. He said, I thought sure that you was a Christian by the interest you showed in that young man. Then Gypsy, or the sheriff, told the story. He said, when I was a man, young man about that age, I attended a revival meeting similar to this one, and I felt the urge to go forward and give my heart to Jesus. But my dad caught me by the arm and he said, just wait and we'll talk about it when we get home. He said, when we got home, we did talk about it, but that feeling was not there. That urge has never been there since. And now I have no desire to be called a Christian. A similar thing happened in our church. A man I only saw in the church one time, back when W.A. was a pastor. And he later moved out of the community, out near the river, near the Boys Creek School. And I'd heard that he was pretty sick and he was getting down in the years. And it's back when uh, Brother Carl was our pastor and he was uh, training some of us in a visiting program called the EE program or Evangelism Exposure. And I had, I was the leader of one of our groups. We'd take a boy, in, uh, or they would go in groups, a mixed group, so there'd be a woman or a man in each group. and. If the woman or man was our brother Seth, they'd feel comfortable with that knee in them. So we went out, took my group out to visit him. And the first, you, when you go in, they're kind of calmed up. They don't want to talk much. So we were trying to look around and maybe find a picture or something to bring up to get them started, get them loosened up a little. Then the first question you ask is, have you come to a place in your spiritual life where you know for certain if you die today that you go to heaven? And he just took over. He said back when W.A. was a pastor, he said, I attended a meeting at church and I felt that I should go forward and get right with God, but I didn't go and now it's too late. And we could not convince him that God was still in the saving business. It was so hard. I mentioned that to W.A. I promised my grandson I wouldn't cry. <laughs> he said, yeah, I remember that. Said so I could tell he was under conviction. And he did start. But his wife kind of sniggered and held her hand out and stopped him. Oh, I'd hate to be in her shoes. So when the invitation comes, don't start gathering up your stuff to go home, but pray like you never prayed before. Pat you cup. You know, I, I don't need to say a lot. That was a wonderful and powerful message, Brother Clyde. And I couldn't offer a better invitation. Do you know Jesus? Do you have that peace and assurance in your heart? That if your heart stopped in the next five minutes, you know without a doubt that you would go to heaven. It all depends on what you've done with Christ in your life. And I would just add this. Be sure that you have more than a head knowledge of Jesus. Be sure there's come that moment in your life where you recognize that Jesus hung on that cross for your sin. There's no room for pride. There's no room for well, that person is worse than I am. 
It took grace and the mercy of God to save each one of us. So we must come and admit that we are sinners. And then we must, by faith, believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and what he did for us at Calvary's cross, that he died there in our stead, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he lives. We must repent of our sin, turn away from our sin, turn to Christ, and put all of our trust and all of our faith in him. That's what saves us. And listen, if you just want to say a prayer so you can go to heaven, but you really don't want Jesus, that's not salvation. Yes, we say a prayer and ask God to forgive us so we can go to heaven, but our heart must be to make him the Lord of our life and follow him from that day on. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Maybe there's someone here today and you say, Pastor, I want to be certain that I know Christ. I want to pray with you. I want you to pray and talk to God. He sees your heart. So be sincere. A prayer like this and mean it with everything you have. Dear God. Thank you for loving me so incredibly much. You're that loving father. In the story. And I'm the one who's wandered. I'm the one lost in sin. Forgive me of all my sin, Lord. Jesus, I believe that you died in my place on the cross. Thank you. Come into my life, Lord. Be my Savior and my Lord. I don't want to live this life by myself anymore. Lord, you take over. And help me follow you always. Thank you for loving me so much, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, and you know that you just settled it in your heart once and for all, I want you to put all pride aside. In just a moment, the music's going to begin to play, and we're going to have an invitation. And I invite you to come. I invite you to come and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you. And then I want to pray for you and we want to rejoice with you. But put pride aside. I tell people all the time, Jesus hung publicly for us, naked on a cross. That's how much he loved us. We can step out and walk down an aisle for him. Amen. So if the Lord has worked in your heart today and he's spoken to you, you come. You come. Let's sing.